screen light? Yep. Yep, it's on. I'll try to talk down. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so thank you for the invitation to present here today. It's quite an honor to be here. And I guess if I had seen the list of speakers ahead of time and all the ologists, I might have been a little more apprehensive about saying yes. But <laughs> here I am. Um, and I'd like to share with you all a little bit about our fire program in central Minnesota at the Lake Alexander Preserve. It's, it's a quite humble program. Um, it's kind of a low budget thing. But you know, maybe there's a lesson there about we all have big dreams of big scale impacts on the ecosystem, good quality impacts. But you know, at some point, you just have to start somewhere. And hopefully, you can start small and dream big. So that's where we're at with our program in central Minnesota. So um, where we're at, we're right in the center of the state, uh, just west of Brainerd. The Camp Ripley is right there. We're on the, we have a preserve on the west side of Camp Ripley. Um, it's a pretty neat area of the state just because we're in a, a, real, um, a real transition zone. You know, we're right on that border between the, the prairie forest border and the Laurentian mixed forest. Um, in this landscape, we see just a real diversity of habitat types. Um, one of the large features in the landscape is the St. Croix moraine and the associated outwash plains, the glacial moraine, and the plains associated with it. Um, just because of the location in the state, we have just a wide array of habitat types, everything from uh, even just, just south of this area, almost pure row crops. And we've got the prairies, wet meadows. We've got oak savannas, um, deciduous hardwood forests, um, mesic forests, dry forests. We've got a smattering of jack pine, white pine, red pine. Um, and We've got deep glacial lakes, shallow lakes. We've got ephemeral wetlands, all mixed in this just jumble of topography. And it sets a stage for a really um, diverse habitat types, all kind of compacted into a, a small area. Another thing that we have in the landscape is quite a bit of conservation lands. Um, a large percentage for this part of the state, especially, especially for the southern part of the state, I know when you get into national, northern Minnesota with national forests, there's a lot of public land. But for this part of the state, this is pretty impressive, the percentage of conservation lands that we have. So there's a great opportunity to do, to do some, some good conservation there at, at a scale. Um, just taking a little closer look at what the Conservancy owns, we have um, about just shy of 2,000 acres of our own property um, on the south side of Lake Alexander west side of Camp Ripley, and then we have another roughly 1,000 acres in conservation easements surrounding our property, bordering our property. And you can see in this slide some of the topography and some of the wetlands and lakes that we have kind of perched in the, in the moraine and topography just provides a real um, diverse habitat. The area has kind of because of that really dry, rocky, really wet matrix, um, not a lot of human impact other than clear cut at settlement and some logging. Um, but you know, generally, people didn't try to break it or farm it. Um, there's a little bit of grazing history in the forest systems there, um, some small meadows for hay, but pretty minimal human impact. So it's, it's a good place to work. Um, the landscape itself, um, like I said, it's, it's a mix of forest types, dry music and music forests. Um, generally, it's a pretty mature forest, or it's, it's a mature forest, so kind of a uniform age growth or age group, and like roughly 50 to 150 years old. The mixture in the canopy is um, pretty heavily dominated by red oak, but we do have some white oak in there. Um, we've got, like I said, a smattering of different pines, jack pine, red pine, white pine. Um, there's aspen, birch, maple. Um, the, there's not a lot of regeneration for the oak that we're seeing in the landscape. Um, and kind of locally abundant white pine regeneration. And mostly we're seeing a lot of red maple. Um, and that's kind of the direction this thing is going down the mesification route. Um, the locally abundant uh, white pine regeneration is predominantly on the edges. Um, and so because we have all the wetlands kind of scattered throughout the forest, we do have a lot of edge effect. And so where there's the light conditions around the edges, we do have some different age classes of the white pine. And um, 
but it, once you get into the interior of the forest, there's not a lot of that. It's just a lot of red maple. Um, so our management goals uh, on the short term at this site are um, to create a favorable seed bed. We're trying to promote the white, white pine and red oak, um, trying to get that, those cohorts back into the seedling stage, um, in the regen stage. Uh, we do, do want to try to maintain them in the subcanopy so that when we start to lose some of the canopy, it's not just the red, ma red maple that's sitting there waiting to come up. Um, and then we are fighting a battle with ironwood, um, the, the young red maple, and, and hazel in the understory. So on the short term, those are the things that we're targeting. The longer term, um, do some thinning in the subcanopy and canopy and create some openings to try to encourage the recruitment of those seedlings um, up into the canopy, um, particularly the oak and pine, just because that's what we're, we feel like we're losing in the landscape. Um, and overall goals, just to manage the forest for structural diversity, different age classes, so it's a, and, and different species composition um, in, the, in the trees, but also in the herbaceous community, um, just so that we have a, a resilient system to resilient to climate change and disturbance regimes and um, whatever may come. So um, we bought the, or we started owning land there in that landscape in the early 70s and didn't do a lot of management there until the early 2000s. About 2003, we entered into a relationship with Camp Ripley um, to work with them on some fire management out there. Camp Ripley had a really robust fire program that focused on hazard reduction burns. So they did everything they could to reduce hazards with their fire, right? Um, so they do a lot of training. Um, they and the training starts wildfires as a result. And that's usually in the summer months where the wildfires become a problem. So every spring they do um, fuel reduction burns in those training areas where the wildfires are likely to happen so that when they start, they just don't have a lot of fuel to spread. So we started working with them, um, not so much on those hazard reduction burns, but the hazard reduction burns are these blue polygons um, those are the ranges where they have live firing, where they get the wildfires, they burn them annually. And they always have. Um, but the Conservancy got involved in helping out with um, some of the burns outside of those ranges. You know, we recognized the system that we had there with our preserve there, the ecosystems and, and the need for fire in some of those forests. forests. And so we worked with them to start um, what they call their ecological fire program. So burning outside of those ranges, um, starting to burn for ecological purposes. And we spent eight years working with them. We put fire on the ground in a hundred different sites. Well, not a hundred different sites, but a hundred different burns with them on those ecological burns outside of the ranges. And um, some of those were dual entry or even triple entry, but a lot of them single entry burns. Um, and a lot of it is, it's the same forest types that I just described for our Lake Alexander Preserve. So while we were getting our, um, getting some experience working with the forest systems and burning those forest systems there at Camp Ripley, we, we established some long-term monitoring plots on our own preserve. So this is back over at the Nature Conservancy's preserve. Um, this is just one piece of our property. And we started to develop a, a fire program where we could experiment a little bit with some different treatments, um, some, different man some different fire, um, but really measure. We, we set up some baseline data, um, transects, and we wanted to try to measure, you know, what are these fires actually doing to the herbaceous layer and to the seedling and sapling layer, and try to get some real concrete data to, to help us inform what these fires can or can't do um, for, our, for our management goals. So, um, to date, we started burning on this preserve in about 2005, I think, was the first burn. And we've put fire on the ground 11 times. Um, so we're averaging about one a year. Um, but some of these have been burned two times now, and most of them have burned, been burned just once. So it's a pretty humble beginning, but, um, you know, we're, we're seeing some some effects, and um, one of the trends that we generally are seeing is that our fall fires are cooler and less intense than our spring fires. 
Um, we, you know, that was kind of counterintuitive to what I thought we might see um, with my little knowledge, thinking that snowpack would be an impact and the moisture from the snow melt would cool down the fires in the spring, but that's not the case. Um, and we do see a lot of heterogeneity in our fires. Um, it's pretty patchy because of the topography, the wetlands. You get into some saturated soils and low mesic forest areas and they just, um, the fire just is cooler and more mosaic. And then you get into the drier, higher sites and you get a little hotter, a um, little faster moving fires. Um, but those are kind of some of the trends that we're seeing. Uh, so this is the same site uh, burned in 2008 in the spring and then burned again in 2011 in the fall. So upon initial um, look, you know, the visual impacts of our fires are pretty obvious that we're getting a little more sunlight through the subcanopy, or the, yeah, the subcanopy shrub layer, a um, little more sunlight to the ground. We are getting some good mineral soil for seed contact um, out of these fires. But we're just, um, it's still a pretty small scale. And, you know, we always want to try to make a bigger impact than, than we are. And so, you know, but I think there's opportunity with, with Camp Ripley doing the fires that they're doing over there um, and then what we're doing. There's an opportunity to do some, a pretty big, make a pretty big impact and even scale up some of the mm -hmm. stuff that we're doing in that landscape. Um, so I said we set up some baseline data, some to collect some data out there and some control plots and then some burn plots just to kind of see what's going on. So the things that we're measuring, uh, starting at the ground, we measure uh, duff thickness, we measure the leaf litter thickness or leaf litter depth, um, we take kind of a visual assessment of uh, the severity of earthworm impact, um, and then we take a look at the coarse woody debris. We have four size, size classes there, one hour, 10 hour, 100 hour, and greater than 100 hour size classes for um, the coarse woody debris. And formatting doesn't work here, so it didn't work. So um, then we move into the herbaceous layer and we do a full inventory of the herbaceous plants along the transect. Then we move into the seedling, um, things that are less than um, a half a meter seedling inventory. We also take uh, a measurement of live and dead shrubs. Um, so those are greater than a meter, but less than 10 centimeters in diameter. And then um, we take a, a canopy uh, measurement. So we're also looking at live and, sta live and dead standing trees um, along the transect. So, um, you know, we don't have a ton of data. We don't have a ton of data points just because we've only burned a few, a handful of times out there. but real basic cursory look, um, kind of preliminary look at what we're doing, what we're seeing out there. This is um, the seedling class and we, are, we do see a lot of um, seedlings out there. Just after a fire we see thousands of little white pine seedlings all over the place, but they're not showing up in this, um, we're, not, we're not picking those up in this measurement because these are half a, centi half a meter tall. Um, so. So we're not seeing a lot of the red oak and white pine um, impact there with our fires in the seedling level. Um, kind of hoping it's there, but we also have a pretty heavy deer browse issue out there. Um, but we are seeing a reduction. So the blue is the control and the, the orange is the fire. We are seeing a reduction in um, ironwood seedlings um, and I guess a slight reduction, but probably not statistically significant on the red maple seedling reduction with the fire. Um, the paper birch big um, uptick both in the control and the burn for seedlings um, kind of had us scratching our heads a little bit but we're maybe speculating that um, that's stump sprouting from dying paper birch both in the control and in the burn areas. <clears throat> Uh, moving into the sapling level, the shrub level, um, this is where we see a, a really significant um, reduction in ironwood at, with our burns and actually an uptick in ironwood in the control plot. Um, the other thing, you know, we are seeing a reduction in the red maple. We like to see that. So with those two, we pretty much think we're doing some big stuff with our fires out there um, for our goals. But 
you know, one of the th ones that jumps out at us is this sugar maple reduction, both in um, in the control and the fire. So, and and I don't really know what to think of that. So, open to suggestions there. Um, <clears throat> and then looking at the canopy trees, um, you know, there's not a lot of this is a pretty stable graph. There's not a lot of change going on um, with these. The and, th and that's kind of to be expected. We're doing cool surface fires. We're not necessarily going to be killing big trees or making a big impact on the canopy with those fires. But um, the one thing that kind of jumps out at us is a little bit of a reduction in the, in the control and in the burn site uh, for basswood and aspen. We think that may be that they're getting closer to the end of their life um, and it's just the age of those. So we're seeing good effects um, at the surface with the seedlings the shrub layer um, with our fires, but you know we're going to have to do some thinning, some canopy gaps in order to help get some more sunlight in there to help recruit those seedlings, and um, we're also going to have to address deer browse to get them moving up into the into the sub canopy and then eventually the canopy. But you know we are finding that these fires are doing good things at that level for us. The um, they're not going to do much in the canopy, but they're they're doing good things on the on the ground for us. And we're finding that um, they're pretty easy to pull off. Initially, I was pretty um, just apprehensive about burning in the forest. I come from a prairie state. I know how to burn prairies, and I was a little apprehensive. Well, there's going to be narrower windows because of the fuel conditions, the weather conditions. There's going to be longer residual burning with the oaks. But you know, by and large, we're still seeing a lot of burn windows available to us. And surprisingly more than I thought we would. And, um, we don't see a ton of residual burning with the oak. It tends to be a day of kind of monitoring and hanging out on it afterwards. And a couple days, you know, a couple burns we've had two or three days. But, um, you know, by and large, these are pretty cool fires. Flame lengths and rates of spread are small, are low, um, easy to manage. We're able to get by with pretty small crews. Uh, these are pretty low budget burns. Um, we're running on average eight to ten crew members, um, and some pretty simple equipment. We don't have to have complex um, or real specialized equipment to do these burns. So it's a good tool for us. Um, one of the things I'd like to close with is, you know, when I became a burn boss, um, a good friend of mine told me, you know, now that you're a burn boss, um, it's going to be so easy for you to find excuses not to burn. You'll find more and more you have good excuses not to burn. But the challenge is going to be to try to find the reason to burn, have a bias for action, and find reasons to burn. And so he challenged me to do that. And I've really taken that to heart. And um, that's what has driven this fire program so far in, in our Lake Alexander Preserve. Um, and I want to share a, a piece that a friend of mine uh, and a former mentor of mine wrote, this is from Johnny Stowe in South Carolina. Um, he says, few if any managers have the staff funding or full commitment of their supervisors necessary to treat all the acres needing fire given the limited number of days with acceptable weather and fuel conditions. One impediment is the lack of incentives for a fire manager to take risks. It is much easier and professionally safer to advocate the benefits of fire but to never have the right conditions than it is to shoulder the risks involved with authorizing or conducting a burn. Prescribed fire requires action, and with action comes responsibility. Fire exclusion is often a do-nothing, then-react approach that ensures anonymity and protection from the responsibility of taking action. He says, although the risk of a bad outcome decreases with multiple burns on an area, it never disappears, and the law of averages always is at work. Currently, there are few, if any, incentives for doing the right thing other than one's own belief that as a manager, it is my obligation and moral responsibility to future generations to try to maintain healthy, fully functional ecosystems. So I have that hanging on my wall in my office. And each burn season, as I'm trying to decide, is it a burn day or not, and I start to come up with those reasons, well, maybe it's not the best burn day because what if we do this, and what if we damage these trees, or whatever? You know, you just all the all the ideas that go through your head that could be barriers to burning. I take a look at that on my wall, and I think I got to have a bias for action. If I, if I don't do it, who is going to do it? So um, 
with that, I, I, I would just encourage people in this room, there's a, there's a real positive vibe about fire in the forest in this room. Um, just encourage people to continue to promote the use of fire in Minnesota's forests, both in verbiage and in action, um, no matter what the scale, even if, it, even if it's small. Um, just try to have that bias for action and um, knock down the barriers and take the steps that are necessary to, to make fire happen. Do the right thing. Put some more good fire in Minnesota's forests. All right, thank you.